G'day, this is Chris Savage from Ariel Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Book of Ezekiel. I pray that it will be of benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. So welcome. We're into session 25. We're up to uh, chapter 33. We're going to hopefully cover from verse 1 to verse 29 tonight. Now, we're into a new section now. Uh, we're into the restoration of Israel. This goes from 33.1 to 39.29. Um, the theme of this section, as I said, is the restoration of Israel, and the whole section is divided up into some smaller units. We see the, the prophet as a watchman in 33 verses 1 to 33, and then, uh, and that's even divided easy further. The duties of a watchman we see in verses 1 to 6. Uh, we'll just, uh, it says here in, in verse 1, and the word of Jehovah came on to me, that's on to Ezekiel. So in verse 1, we see once again here, the word of God comes to Ezekiel the prophet. Now, as we're going to read through this chapter, uh, certain statements will be recognized which were made previously in the book. In fact, we have two echoes, if you like, uh, of the same kind of material. For example, the first is the commission to the watchman. We saw that back in chapter 3, and now we're seeing it again here. The second echo is the exhortation to individual personal responsibility. Uh, it was seen for the first time in chapter 3, and then for the second time in chapter 18, and here we're going to see it all again. So essentially, uh, what is now happening in this chapter is a kind of a repetition. It's a summary of material that Ezekiel has covered previously. But he's now moving into a brand new section, a major area where, where he is dealing with the prophecies concerning the restoration of Israel. Now, previously, it has been prophecies against the land of Israel and the nation of Judah. That was what his prophecies were previously. Now it's going to take a different slant. What we're going to see is here. Um, did I just read, read do that? Uh, yeah. So here, what he's actually doing in chapter 33 is, is more or less summarizing the earlier material in his book before he moves into this uh, brand new material dealing with the restoration. So chapter three was, is going to develop some certain themes as it moves along. Uh, we're going to I'll just give you a bit of an overview of, of 33 before we get into it verse by verse. Now, first thing he's going to do in chapter 33 is to deal with the duties of a watchman, which is really talked about back in chapter 3, 7 to 21. Now he gonna, he's going to restate the responsibilities of a watchman. Why? Because what we have is a new section of prophecies. So back in chapter 3, the duties of the watchman were spelled out in preparation for the prophecies against Israel and the destruction of Israel. Now we've got a new section of prophecies. And this here we're going to see the duties of the watchman here are restated in preparation for those prophecies that will now deal with the restoration of Israel. The second thing in this chapter is the explanation of God's justice, which is something he's reviewing from as far back as chapter 18. Third section of this chapter is the arrival of the refugee or the fugitive from Jerusalem, which picks up from chapter 24, verse 25 to 27. And this shows that basically uh, chapter 25 to chapter 32 were a bit of an insertion uh, between the prediction of the coming of the refugee and his actual arrival. So it's just stuck in the middle there. And then in the fourth section, we have a prophecy of rebuke, which summarizes the first half of Ezekiel's book. Uh, and this is the material which has been primarily prophecy against Israel is now summarized. So these are the four main sections of chapter 33, which we're going to go through step by step. Now, chapters 33 to 39 deal with the restoration using both types of restoration talked about earlier. Sometimes, sometimes we're going to see in 33 to 39, Ezekiel will be referring to restoration in unbelief, in preparation for the judgment of the great tribulation. At other times, he'll be dealing with the final restoration, which is the restoration in faith, in preparation for the blessing of the millennial kingdom. But as we go through those chapters, we'll see that. The main emphasis is going to be on that final worldwide regathering, which is going to be a restoration in faith, in preparation for blessing. So these chapters 
a 33 to 39 deal with the restoration of Israel. Now, what is happening in the first three chapters, 33 to 36 or 33 to 35, is the removal of all obstacles to Israel's final restoration. And then chapters 36 to 39 deal with the restoration itself. Concerning the three chapters here, which deal with the removal of obstacles, three things are removed. In chapter 33, unbelief is removed. In chapter 34, false rulers are removed. In chapter 35, the nation of Edom, which is a major obstacle to the final restoration of Israel, will be removed. One last thing by way of introduction. In dealing with the function of a watchman and the prophetic role of a watchman, this is not the only passage that deals with it. Neither is Ezekiel the only prophet who mentions this concept of the role of a prophet in connection with the task of a watchman. In fact, uh, we, we, see, uh, we see a complete picture of both the literal and the prophetic role in, in some passages. There. Second Samuel 18, 24 to 25, Second Kings 9, verse 17, Jeremiah 4, verse 5, and Jeremiah 6, verse 1, Hosea 8, 1, Amos 3, 6, Habakkuk 2, 1. So uh, in those passages, you see the role, uh, both uh, literal and prophetic role of the watchman. <clears throat> okay, so with duties of the watchman, we see we're going to go back to verse 2. Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from among them and set him for their watchman, if when he sees the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever hears the sound of the trumpet and takes not warning, the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. Verse 5. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but he took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. Whereas, if he had taken warning, he would have delivered his soul. But if the watchman sees the sword come and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned and the sword come and take any person from among them, he's taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So in verse 2 of Ezekiel 33, he deals with the appointment of the watchman. He starts that by saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people, saying, so these are, of course, he's speaking to the Jewish people here. The emphasis here is that after addressing the Gentiles, which we've already done in chapter 25 to 32, in this chapter, he's now to address his own people, his Jewish people, once again. And then in addressing them, he has to give them a similar warning to the one he gave them before. When I bring a sword upon the land, that is, when God announces the coming of judgment, and the people of the land take a man from among them, that is, the people of the land who are being threatened now by invasion, they choose one of their own uh, people for the purpose of serving as a watchman, and it's to keep a lookout for the invading army. Now, the reason they'd want to choose uh, one of their own nationals is because he would be much more likely to be, uh, to be loyal to his own people. So one of their own people would now be selected to act as a watchman, to be on the lookout and to warn them when he sees the invading army approaching. And then in verses 3 to 5, the scenario is put forward that the watchman does not warn the people. And in verse 3, we have the warning. If, when he sees a sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. This means he's doing his duty. He sees the invading army coming, and by way of warning, he blows a trumpet. That's what he's supposed to do. Now, once he's done his duty and warned them, in verse 4, he has fulfilled his responsibility. My job is done. Now it's up to the citizen, having heard the warning trumpet, to now respond correctly. Whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. So the watchman has done his job in blowing the trumpet and given the warning. However, if someone hears the sound and he knows what it means, and yet does not take any steps to protect himself, and then is subsequently killed in the invasion, he has no one to blame but himself. Because in verse 5, he did hear the sound of the trumpet, and he took not warning. He'll be held responsible for his own death. Had he taken warning, 
Notice what the rest of verse 5 says. He would have delivered his soul. Now, note here. Ezekiel is dealing with physical death, not spiritual death. Why do I say that? Because no invading army can inflict spiritual death. So obviously the issue here is going to be physical death. So the phrase, he would have delivered his soul, means he would have saved his own life had he taken appropriate steps after hearing the warning trumpet. So this passage is not dealing with spiritual life or spiritual death. This context, therefore, can... Uh, this context cannot be used to teach that the believer can lose his salvation, as is often done from this passage. The very background to it has to do with the physical aspects of invasion. So in verses 3 to 5, the problem has not been with the watchman. He did blow the trumpet. But if anyone who heard it is later killed, it's his own problem, because he had been warned and he failed to take heed. A bit like us today, we shared the gospel with someone and they said, no, I'm going to take my chances. Well, here you go. Now, verse 6 gives us the corollary to that. What if the watchman fails? But if the watchman sees the sword come, that is, he, he sees the invading army approaching, and he blows not the trumpet, and thereby he fails in his obligation so that the people are not warned, and the sword come and take it, any person from among them. So if he's negligent, negligent and as a result of his negligence, his people start getting killed, it will be a result of their own iniquity, right? He's taken away in his, in his iniquity because remember, in the beginning, God is the one who's sending the army as a punishment for sin. But if the watchman does not warn the people, they're going to die because they're still held responsible for their sin. Yet God will now also hold the watchman responsible because although he knew his duty, he failed to fulfill it. He saw the invader coming, but he didn't blow the trumpet. Could have been asleep. Who knows? And just as the hearer would now be judged physically by death, the watchman, the prophet, will also be judged physically. His blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So nevertheless now, the watchman is still responsible to give the warning. And the correlation of this to the prophet is that the prophet is also responsible to warn the people. If the watchman or the prophet fails to give the warning in his ministry, then God will hold him responsible and he too will suffer a physical death during the invasion. And we'll see the application to the prophet in verses 7 to 9. So you, son of man, I have set you a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die. And you do not speak to warn the wicked man from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, and he turned not from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. So here we have, in, in verses 7 to 9 here, we have the application of the principle, what we saw back in verses 1 to 6, to the prophet himself now. In verse 7, the watchman, who was used parabolically, in verses 1 to 6, is now clearly identified as Ezekiel himself. So you, here comes the application. In like manner, Ezekiel, I have set you a watchman unto the house of Israel. God has appointed Ezekiel to be a watchman prophet to Israel, and he's to give them the warning. Therefore, because of this divine appointment, hear the word at my mouth. Now, Ezekiel, remember, is responsible for receiving direct revelation from God, because that's what a prophet does. And he's supposed to give them warning from God. So Ezekiel is to pass on to Israel what the revelation is to Israel. So as a prophet, Ezekiel must do two things. Number one, he must hear the word of Jehovah. He must receive divine revelation. But number two, having received it, he cannot hold it to himself. He must turn to Israel and give the people the prophetic message. That will be his way of blowing the trumpet.
Now, in verse 8, God spells out what will happen if Ezekiel fails. When I say, O wicked man, you shall surely die. So when God threatens the wicked man with physical death, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, so if Ezekiel fails to pass on the warning to the wicked person, then that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. The man will still die physically because of his sins. Remember, we're not talking here about someone who is spiritually alive and then because of sin dies spiritually and loses his salvation. That doesn't happen. He starts out as a wicked man. It's not a saved man who is being warned against wickedness. This is a man who is already wicked, an unsaved man, whom God is now threatening with physical death because of his sinful deeds. Ezekiel is to warn him. If he does not, that man will still die because of his sins, not because of a lack of warning. Now, if Ezekiel fails in his prophetic function to give him due warning, then the Lord says, his blood, the man who's just died, his blood will I require at your hand. So even a prophet of God can be judged with physical death. In, in or Actually, uh, we have a we have the, the story of there was an unnamed prophet who is simply called the man of God who disobeyed the Lord. The, the Lord says to him, go and give the message and come straight back. And he tarried and he had some lunch or something else. And the Lord struck him dead by allowing him to be attacked by a lion. That was a man of God. It was a prophet of God who God killed because he disobeyed him. Now, on the other hand, in verse 9, envisages what will happen if Ezekiel does fulfill his prophetic office and he gives a clear warning. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, so he's calling upon Ezekiel now in order to, calling Ezekiel to talk to the man in order to bring him to repentance. If he refuses to take the prophetic warning and he turn not from it and refuses to repent, he shall die in his iniquity. He'll die because of his own sins. But you have delivered your own soul, Ezekiel. The prophet has fulfilled his function as a watchman prophet. So any problem is not with Ezekiel. It's with his hearers. In verses 1 to 9, we have this principle of the prophet of God serving as a watchman. And verses 10 to 20, we have two specific declarations to Israel. But by the way, um, in this time now, which here, Israel is Judah. All right, we're talking Judah, but it's called Israel now because uh, Northern Kingdom taken away quite a while before. Now, we see the declaration to Israel in verses 10 to 20. First declaration is verses 10 to 16. And you, son of man, say unto the house of Israel, Thus you speak, saying, Our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we pine away in them. How then can we live? Say unto them, As I live, says the Lord Jehovah, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? And you, son of man, say unto the children of your people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. And as for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turns from his wickedness. Neither shall he that is righteous be able to live thereby in the day that he sinneth. Verse 13. When I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trust to his righteousness and commit iniquity, none of his righteous deeds shall be remembered. But in his iniquity that he hath committed, therein shall he die. Verse 14, again, when I say unto the wicked, you shall surely die. If he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right, if the wicked restore the pledge, give again that which he had taken by robbery, walk in the statutes of life, committing no iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of his sins that he hath committed shall be remembered against him. He hath done that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live. Okay. So here we have these declarations to Israel. In, uh, we have the first declaration. In, in each of these declarations, we first of all have Israel's complaint, which is then followed by God's answer. So in verse 10, we have Israel's complaint. You son of man, say unto the house of Israel. So he's talking to the house of Israel. And early in verses 1 to 9, God has been dealing with the responsibility of the watchman. Now, in this section, God is now concerned with the responsibility of the hearer. 
As a watchman, Ezekiel announces the mercy of God to those who turn away from sin. That is the point of this next section. In dealing with Israel, thus you speak, saying. So God hears Israel's first complaint. And what is that complaint? They say, our transgressions and our sins are upon us. And we pine away in them. How then can we live? So the basic emphasis of this first complaint is that Israel now recognizes that they're in a sinful state. But they say they're so deeply into it, how can they possibly live? How will they actually survive? Now, to some extent, what this objection shows is how Israel's attitude has changed since chapter 18. Ezekiel's prophecies in which he dealt with the approaching destruction of Jerusalem have all been fulfilled by this time. And in light of the fact that the prophecies of the destruction of Jerusalem and the kingdom of Judah have been fulfilled, the question that arises is, how will the diaspora Jews live? How will those who have now been scattered survive? Basically, God is going to explain to them that the answer is the same as it always was in the past, because God has not changed. So, that is Israel's complaint. And in verses 11 to 16, we have God's answer. Now, several things are clearly stated here. First, in verse 11, there's a call to repentance. As I live, saith the Lord Jehovah. So this, this emphasizes the solemnity of what God is about to say. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God does not rejoice when a wicked person dies. But that the wicked turn from him, sorry, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. That's God's desire, that the wicked repent. Why does he send watchmen? Why does he send prophets? Because God gets no personal pleasure <laughs> from the death of the wicked. What he does get pleasure from is when he sees wicked people coming to repentance. And because that is his overwhelming desire, we have the call to repentance. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. He says it twice in order to be emphatic about it. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? The fact that this is a national call to the house of Israel shows that the life and death he's dealing with here is physical life or physical death for the nation. It is directed to the nation specifically, O house of Israel. So God is calling the Jewish nation to repent nationally because it was national sin that brought about the fall of Judah and it will be national repentance that will bring about their restoration. So in verse 11, first of all, we have the call to repentance. The second thing is God's answer, in God's answer is the principle in verse 12. And thou, son of man, say unto the children of thy people, so this is what Ezekiel is to say in answer to their question in verse 10, how, how then can we live? How will we survive? The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. So what he's saying here is that all of the righteousness of the past under the Mosaic law cannot cover the problem even of one act of transgression, especially if it's a capital offense. It will bring on death for disobedience. Yet by contrast, a man who has been a sinner all his life can repent and God will accept that repentance. And as for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness, in the day that he repents. So this principle here follows with, neither shall the righteous be able to live thereby in the day that he sins. So in verse 12 is the principle. For a person who has lived a righteous life according to the law of Moses, because that's the law system at this time, that righteousness will not guarantee exemption from physical death if he then violates the law. On the other hand, if a man who has been wicked all his life but has not committed a capital offense under the Mosaic law then repents, he will survive under the Mosaic law. The principle, verse 12, is dealing with, is to be explained as we go into verse 13 to 16 now. Now, the third part of God's answer is in verse 13, which concerns the righteous. When I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, 
because in accordance with the promise of Mosaic law, their righteous acts in keeping the law will bring them light. If he trusts to his righteousness, meaning the righteousness of the law, and then figuring that he has so many good deeds on the law, he can afford to break it now because his past righteousness would be cancelled out. He says, if he commit iniquity against the law of Moses, then none of his past righteous deeds shall be remembered. A person could have kept the law most of his life, but if he then violates the law in any particular thing, he'll be condemned by that same law in spite of all the previous observances of it. Therefore, in his iniquity that he has committed, therein shall he die. This is simply the carrying out the death penalty of the law. If we can bring this into our own day, for instance, and make it pretty, make it clearer. Suppose, you know, I live in the state of Victoria, as I do, and for let's just say for 50 years, I've kept the laws of the state of Victoria. Then at the age of 51, I murder somebody. That act of murder will not be overlooked or forgiven simply because for 50 years previously, I'd kept the Victorian laws. By committing that one act of murder, the Victorian code of law would have been violated. And by that very violation, we then would become subject to imprisonment under the law of Victoria. Remember, we're dealing in Ezekiel with the body of the Mosaic law and relating this to the consequences of physical death, not spiritual death. When anyone committed iniquity, he would die. He would suffer the death penalty of the law, for, for, that is, for an act that called for the death penalty. Now, the fourth part of God's answer we find in verses 14 to 16. And here the wicked are dealt with. First of all, in verse 14, we're concerned with his repentance. If the warning comes, again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and he takes the warning and follows this with repentance, if he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right in accordance with the law of Moses, what is that which is right in accordance with the law of Moses? Well, we have some examples here in verse 15. If the wicked, first of all, restore the pledge. Second, if he give again that which he hath taken by robbery. Third, if he walks in the statutes of life. Fourth, committing no iniquity, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Now, none of, the, none of these particular things here uh, warranted capital punishment under the Mosaic law. They all have to do with the penalty of the law. So, again, we're dealing with physical life or physical death. And in verse 14, if the wicked person is given a warning and he takes it and he repents and then goes on to do that which is lawful and right from, of, of those things which are listed here in verse 15, then the result is now spelled out in verse 16. None of the sins that he hath committed shall be remembered against him. Means he's forgiven. Again, these crimes did not carry the death penalty. He has done that which is lawful and right and by the restoration of what has been taken. So he's given back the pledges, he's given back what he's robbed, all of those sorts of things. So if he's carried out those aspects of the law which required some form of restoration for the things taken, then he shall surely live. He's repented. He'll not lose his physical life in accordance with the law because such violations did not carry the death penalty anyway. But furthermore, he will be forgiven by God and he will not bring physical death upon him because of his previous violations of the law. His death would then be due to human frailty, not as a specific judgment for some particular sin. Just a, just a quick... Now we come to the second declaration, verses 17 to 20. Yet the children of your people say, the way of the Lord is not equal. But as for them, their way is not equal. When the righteous turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, he shall even die therein. And when the wicked turns from his wickedness and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall live thereby. Yet, yet you say, the way of the Lord is not equal, O house of Israel. I will judge you, everyone, after his ways. So here we have the second declaration beginning with Israel's second complaint. The children of your people say the way of the Lord is not equal. They're basically saying here that God is being very unfair. Why should a whole life of righteousness be entirely negated by one act of disobedience? That's just not fair. 
Oh, that's what they're saying anyway. On the other hand, why should a whole life of wickedness be forgiven on the basis of a few final acts of restoration? That's Israel's complaint. God is unjust. He's just not being fair. This is not right. Well, that's what Israel says. But in verse 17, the truth is, as for them, their way is not equal. Israel, their way is not equal. And verses 18 to 20, we have God's answer in which he makes three points. First of all, in verse 18, concerning the righteous, when the righteous turn from his righteousness and commits iniquity, he shall even die therein. This is a repetition of what he said earlier. And then in verse 19, concerning the wicked, when the wicked turns from his wickedness and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall live thereby. Also a summary of what God already said earlier. But then he comes to the conclusion in verse 20. Speaking to Israel, yet you say the way of the Lord is not equal. They're saying this because of the two questions voiced previously. First, why should a whole life of righteousness be negated by one act of disobedience? Or second, on the other side of the coin, why should a whole life of wickedness be forgiven by a few final acts of restoration? But at the end of verse 20, God's answer finishes with, O house of Israel, I will judge you, everyone, after his ways. The answer to Israel's objection lies with the character of God in that, first of all, God does not tolerate sin. He must punish sin, no matter how much righteousness preceded it. And again, God does not tolerate sin and so must punish it no matter how much righteousness preceded it and second conversely god will respond to repentance no matter how much wickedness has preceded that repentance now in verses 21 to 22 we see now the removal of ritual dumbness this is ezekiel it came to pass the twelfth year of our captivity in the ninth, in the tenth month, in the fifth day of the month, that one that had escaped out of Jerusalem came unto me, saying, The city is smitten. Now the hand of Jehovah had been upon me in the evening before he that was escaped came, and he had opened my mouth until he came to me in the morning, and my mouth was opened, and I was no more dumb. So, in this fourth segment of chapter 33, Ezekiel's ritual dumbness is now removed. In the first part of verse 21, we have the date. came to pass in the 12th year of our captivity. 12th year was 586 BC. Now, um, you might find in, in, in the Septuagint versions, it says that was 11th year, which makes it 586 BC. And the problem comes down to whether it took six months for the refugee to get to Ezekiel in Babylon, or did it take 18 months? It's evident that the translators of the Septuagint found it rather hard to believe that it would take a year and a half to make that journey. So they decided there must be a scribal error. And because of this, they made it the 11th year. However, Dr. Fruchtenbaum sticks with the Masoretic Hebrew text as being the accurate on taking it as 585 BC or about 18 months since the city of Jerusalem had been destroyed. Tenth month is a Hebrew month, Tevet, which falls around in December, January. And the fifth day of the month of this prophecy came in the fifth of Tevet, 585 BC, or beginning of December of that year, according to our calendar. Now, by this time, Ezekiel had experienced six years of ritual dumbness, six years of being ritually mute. But now, the arrival of the refugee marks a turning point in his career. In the first part of his prophetic career, he has been overemphasizing continually that Jerusalem would definitely fall. Uh, really, actually, verses 1 to 20 of chapter 33 are simply a summary of what he taught during that first part of his career. Now he comes into the second or the new part of his career when he's going to be dealing with the prophecies about how Jerusalem will, will definitely be restored. And the reason why this date is so important is that it, it does mark a distinct turning point in Ezekiel's career as a prophet. Because in the second part of verse 21, we have the arrival of the Jerusalem refugee. One that had escaped out of Jerusalem came unto me saying, the city is smitten. 
So 18 months after Jerusalem fell, this escapee arrives and lets Ezekiel know that the city had indeed been smitten. This is a fulfillment of Ezekiel 24, 25 to 27, where it, it, in that day, it, 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 24 to 25, chapter 24, 25 to 27 says, when, when, when Jerusalem was destroyed, that in that day, he that escapes shall come to Ezekiel to cause you to hear it with thine ears. And that's exactly what happened. There. There's a fulfillment of chapter 24, verses 25 to 27. Now in verse 22, Ezekiel tells us about his mouth being opened. Now the hand of Jehovah had been upon me in the evening before he that was escaped came. Uh, the point being made here simply is that Ezekiel's mouth was opened so that his ritual dumbness was removed on the evening before the refugee arrived. He had opened my mouth until he came to me in the morning. So when his mouth was open, he spoke the messages that began in chapter 33, verse 23, and now run through to chapter 39, verse 29. So on the evening before the fugitive from Jerusalem arrived, God removed Ezekiel's dumbness. And at that point, he also spoke six prophetic messages contained in chapter 33, 23 to 39, 29. Now the end result in verse 22 is my mouth was opened and I was no more dumb. Now we see uh, a message concerning the Jews in the land in 23 to 29. And the word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, Son of man, they that inhabit those waste places in the land of Israel speak, saying, Abraham was one, and he inherited the land, but we are many. The land is given us for inheritance. Wherefore, say unto them, Thus says the Lord Jehovah, You eat with the blood, and lift your eyes unto idols, and shed blood, and shall you possess the land? You stand upon your sword, you work abomination, and you defile everyone his neighbor's wife. And shall you possess the land? Thus shalt thou say unto them, Thus saith the, the Lord Jehovah, As I live, surely they that are in the waste places shall fall by the sword. And him that is in the open field will I give to the beast to be devoured. And they that are in the strongholds and in the caves shall die of the pestilence. And I will make the land a desolation and an astonishment. And the pride of her power shall cease. And the mountains of Israel shall be desolate so that none shall pass through. Then shall they know that I am Jehovah when I have made the land a desolation and an astonishment because of all their abominations which they have committed. So here in this fifth segment, what we have is a message concerning the Jews who are still in the land. So in this section, it is a message to the Jews who are left back in the land, left back in Judah. In verse 23, again, the word of Jehovah comes to Ezekiel. And as it does so, God is telling him in verse 24 what the remnant back in the land are claiming for themselves. Son of man, they that inhabit those waste places in the land of Israel speak, saying... So this then is a prophecy against the remnant in the land of Judah. Now, this is not the believing remnant, but those who have been left behind <clears throat> after the deportations from the land by the Babylonians. This prophecy is set specifically against them because of a claim that they are making. And their claim is Abraham was one and he inherited the land. But we are many. The land is given to us for inheritance. So this is the claim of those who have been left behind after the destruction because they had not been deported with the rest. Now, Jerusalem had been destroyed. They have a false sense of security and a faulty logic here. What we have here is an example of a false reliance upon God's promises. They're taking a promise of God out of context and appropriating it in such a way that their logic becomes completely false. Their claim is that since God gave Abraham all the land of Israel while he was all alone, with no other Jews around, then logically, well, this means then that the land will become much more firmly ours because we are not alone. We're many. Lots of us living in the land. But what they're fighting to see is the problem of sin. While Abraham and his seed were indeed promised the land, 
Yet the enjoyment of it is conditioned by faithfulness to God. There's no question that the land is owned by the by title deed by Israel. It is their land, according to the promise of God. But their enjoyment of the land which belongs to them is conditional upon their faithfulness. So they're ignoring, or the ones who are in the land currently at this point in time, are they're ignoring or they're failing to see the problem raised by their sin. So they say, Abraham was one, and they fall back in Abraham. But this is a false reliance on the promise of God. In fact, their whole concept of Abraham being one and their being children of Abraham, that was also a very common misinterpretation among the Jews in New Testament times. It actually became a Pharisaic, uh, uh, sorry, it became a cardinal, a doctrine of Pharisaic Judaism to teach that by simply being a descendant of Abraham, every Jew had automatic rights to the kingdom. By simply claiming Abraham as their father, they assumed they had no further obligation and that their sin in this case did not matter. An example of this misinterpretation about the relationship to Abraham, you can see in Matthew chapter 3, verse 9, Matthew 3, 9, Luke 3, 8, Luke 3, 8, John 8, 33, John 8, 33, and John 8, 39. John 8, 39. Yeah. <clears throat> Having stated their false reliance upon God's promises on the basis of their faulty logic, in verses 25 to 26, God now spells out the sins of that present remnant. And it's because of these sins that they'll not get to enjoy the land. So the question is, shall you possess the land? Well, well why not? Because of a number of specific sins. First, you eat with the blood. Eating with the blood was a violation of Genesis 9, 4 and Leviticus Leviticus 3, Leviticus 17, Leviticus 7, Leviticus, and Leviticus 19, 26. Second, you lift up your eyes onto your idols. They're guilty of idolatry in violation of Exodus 20, verses 4 to 5. Exodus 20, verses 4 to 5. Third, they're guilty of murder. You shed blood in violation of Exodus 20, verse 13. Exodus 20, verse 13. Fourth, they're guilty of oppression. You stand upon your sword. Fifth, they're guilty of paganism. You work abominations. Sixth, they're guilty of adultery. You defile everyone, his neighbor's wife, in violation of Exodus 20, verse 14. And they expect to enjoy the land with these sins. <coughs> Now, in light, in light of these six sins, the question comes again. Shall you possess the land? The answer is no. No, in keeping with Deuteronomy 29, verses 25 to 29. So although it is true that by title deed, the land will always belong to the Jews, yet they're failing to realize that their enjoyment of the land is based upon their faithfulness to God. And because of these sins, they'll not enjoy the benefit of possession of the land. And then in verses 27 to 28, he now spells out the twofold judgment upon that remnant. First, there is a judgment upon the people and then a judgment upon the land itself. The judgment upon the people is in verse 27, and that is one of physical death. It starts out with the words, as I live. This is emphasizing the solemnity of the divine earth. Surely they that are in the waste places shall fall by the sword. This means they'll die a violent death. Him that is in the open fear will I give to the beast to be devoured. This refers to dying as a result of being attacked by wild animals. They that are in the strongholds and in the caves shall die of the pestilence. This means they'll die of disease. So this is a judgment of physical death upon those people left in the land. It will come in one of three ways, by sword, wild animals, or by disease. Now, one good example of this is to look at the story of a man called Gedaliah. It's aftermath in the closing chapters of the book of Jeremiah, where there's a very vivid fulfillment of this particular prophecy. So upon the people, the judgment was death. 
In verse 28, upon the land, the judgment was desolation. And I'll make the land a desolation and an astonishment. And the pride of her power shall cease. These people will have no more strength. The mountains of Israel shall be desolate so that none shall pass through. And in verse 29, we have the result. Then shall they know that I am Jehovah. They'll recognize who is God indeed by virtue of the experience of these particular judgments. The timing of this knowledge will come when I have made the land a desolation and an astonishment. When this prophecy has been fulfilled, then they'll recognize who is God indeed. The reason for the, uh, the judgment here is because of all their abominations which they have committed. And that's where we're going to end uh, this session. Thank you for coming along. Study hard and grow strong.